Hi, Laura. Hi. How are you? Um, I'm doing well uh, yeah. here in here in Germany. And you? Um, well, I'm okay. It's kind of a cold, rainy day here today. Yeah. So I'm I'm sort of a uh, hanging hanging out in what is <coughs> what is rapidly becoming the fish room. I, I made a decision last night to convert this rack of books mm -hmm. to a rack of fish tanks. Oh, cool. Mostly it looks kind going, of like a lawyer, a, a yeah, sort of a lawyer style. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. Nice. So it's going to be bowls and jars. Oh, nice. Yeah, that'll look so, great, especially, <laughs> uh, get especially if you have books. some nicely shaped jars and stuff, too. Yeah, I've got books I never look at. So, um, <clears throat> we met you for the first time about two weeks ago mm -hmm. on a live stream we did uh, about um, breeders, fish breeders. I don't think we dealt much with breeders. No, I think I think the person who was planned for that evening uh, couldn't make it, if I remember right. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so I met you in that time frame about mm -hmm. three weeks ago or so. <clears throat> you popped up on Discord. And just before that, Tommy D had come back. He had been gone for about a year mm -hmm. and came back. And he had, he had been doing some really interesting things up to that point. Uh, both of you are in graduate school or have completed graduate work. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I've, I uh, definitely have completed um, graduate work uh, when I did my master's. Um, I did my thesis basically in a nutshell. It was, it was on um, how to homogenize soil samples uh, in order to analyze them for microbiome research purposes. Huh. Well, and that just kind of fits very neatly with, uh, with where we're at and where we're going. The, uh, the process we've been engaged in has been an attempt to take advantage of some of the best research that's going on in uh, uh, microbiology and especially in, in, in soil development and microbiology in, in soils mm -hmm. <clears throat> because it's it has a natural flow into the fish tanks. Yes, it, definitely. The, the aquarium hobby, uh, at least on the freshwater side, has never paid serious attention to, to this aspect of, uh, of, of maintaining uh, an aquatic environment. Mm -hmm. and, and what we know, of course, is that there are certain things that are absolutely key. One of which is the nutritional foundation. And, and that gets us to where we are right now because the primary, the primary element of nutrition is the leaves of trees. Yes. In, in virtually every body of water on fresh water, fresh water, <laughs> every body of fresh water on earth. Yes. Um, from what I'm re I've been reading in the past couple of weeks, that's especially true for streams, which I think account for a large proportion of the tropical fish in the hobby. They, they originally come from streams in their native environment. Um, in streams, uh, what we have, um, what's been found over the years, is that streams don't rely heavily, usually, on primary producers actually living in the stream. So they don't tend to rely very heavily on, um, you know, water plants and, uh, and, and algae um, in order for the in order to um, get energy. Instead, um, they rely on, almost entirely, in some cases, on um, the leaves from the trees adjacent to the stream. Um, and that varies, it, how exactly that happens varies a bit by, by latitude. So here in kind of these, in these temperate latitudes, um, 
it occurs seasonally, of course, when trees um, drop their leaves in the fall. Um, in the tropics, it occurs kind of sort of a slower, more continuous amount throughout the year. Um, and uh, I think it sounds like there's there's often some um, increases in input when there are storms, for example, because that knocks a lot of uh, green leaves and, and fruit and such into uh, the rivers in the tropics when that occurs. Um, but what we're finding is that streams are net heterotrophic. So they rely almost entirely on the decomposition and breakdown of that litter for their, um, their carbon and their energy inputs. Which means that any fish that are living in that stream mm -hmm. are dependent upon the leaves yes. as primary nutrition for the macrofauna. Yes. Well, actually, what's what's really fascinating is that so when you have a leaf that falls into a stream, um, you know, let's say it falls directly from a tree branch overhanging a stream down into down into the water. Initially, what you have happening um, is leaching. So any of the um, secondary metabolites and a goodly amount of um, the nutritional compounds from within the leaves leach out of those leaves in the first, usually it's within the first 24 to 48 hours. At the same time as that's happening, the leaves begin to be um, colonized by microbes um, in a process that we refer to as conditioning. So the, the now by microbes, microbes you mean by microbes you mean what? Um, I'm I'm just getting to that. So the first microbes that um, <laughs> that colonize leaves in general are fungi, um, because the fungi. Um, there's, there's a number of reasons for that. Um, I think from what I'm reading uh, in terms of environmental stoichiometry, I think, which is the, um, basically the, basically it's looking at the ratios of nutrients required by organisms and what they're, the, the ratios that are available to them and the resources that they're consuming. Um, it seems like fungi typically have a more favorable ratio of carbon to, I believe it's phosphorus, um, that more closely matches what's in the leaves initially. Um, and so those fungi come in and they begin to colonize the leaves and that starts kind of softening the leaves a little bit, making it easier for the next microbes that begin to colonize, which are bacteria. Um, and so combined, the fungi and the bacteria begin this, they, they um, do this whole process of conditioning in which uh, things like, you know, leaves that have, say, waxy coatings, um, that kind of starts to get broken down. The leaves actually become more palatable to detritivores, the, the, um, the, the larger organisms that then come in and eat the leaves once they are conditioned. Um, and it also helps to... Um, <clears throat> helps with, again, those nutrient ratios. It makes those, again, more favorable to the animals that come later. And that varies, of course, you know, um, depending on where you are here in the temperate latitudes um, here in Europe, um, and also, I think, in a significant portion of North America, uh, the, those uh, initial detritivores tend to be insects. Um, but in the tropics, there aren't so many insect detritivores. Instead, we have crustaceans, um, and particularly larger crustaceans, I think, from what I'm hearing. Oh. Okay, so what brought this up was a discussion about putting leaves in fish tanks. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's something that it sounds like people have been doing for a lot of years. They've been putting um, leaves into tanks um, in order to, you know, for example, raise the levels of tannins in the tank or um, to provide food for some, um, some tank species like shrimp, for example. Um, and so we were, I think initially we were pretty interested in figuring out um, maybe a guide to what leaves are good to use 
depending on the area you're living in um, and, you know, like what to look for, when to look for them um, and what ratios of, you know, different types of leaves can help you to achieve different results. You know, if you're looking for maybe a more black water type environment, um, you might want to pick some leaves that will get you there. Um, but if you don't want that, there's leaves that you can add that aren't going to color the water so much, that kind of a thing. Okay, so as we began to talk about this, we realized we didn't know very much about it. Mm -hmm. um, and you and Tommy, both of whom are, are research scientists, made a commitment to look into it and, and to begin to try to figure out what it was all about. So yes. you've been at this now for about two weeks, I guess. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's about right. Well, to give us an idea, first of all, an overview of where you're at, what your thinking is, and where you want this to be headed. So right now, we are still in the phase of um, literature review. So we're looking at what literature is out there. Um, so we're looking at everything from um, blog posts to scientific journal articles to textbooks. Um, I've just spent most of the last two weeks um, doing a deep dive into a, a textbook that dealt specifically with um, the decomposition of leaves and streams. And then Tommy's been looking all over the place at he, he has an amazing library where he is in Denmark that he that he keeps coming up with all these wonderful books on particularly the tropics and stream ecology in the tropics. Um, and we've we've been sharing um, a lot of clips from uh, different books and stuff to try and kind of figure out what the general consensus is about um, leaves uh, in in the ecosystem in particular and how that okay that so where happens. where do you where do you sense you're headed with this project so i think what we're looking to do um right now is come up with a guidance document for um fish keepers and aquarists um sort of like what i was talking about before um we may even uh maybe have like a basic um guidance document for people that just want you know a quick down and dirty um guide that doesn't go into a whole lot of detail and perhaps um, also a much more in-depth guidance document that not only tells you what you need, but precisely why you need it um, and the science behind it as well. Huh. Mm -hmm. for, okay. for those of us who are nerds like, like we are. <laughs> so we're getting serious about this. Yes. We've been talking about things like the food web. Mm -hmm. for, for about a year now, uh, and, and we're beginning, I think, to nail down what it is we're really talking about mm -hmm. uh, and, and how it really can um, be applied to an aquarium. Yes. I, from what I understand, the goal is to create a more or less self-sustaining ecosystem in as much as possible within the aquarium so that it's not just, you know, some fish in a box that you're constantly feeding. They're able to sustain themselves to a, to a certain degree and you have different trophic levels within your tank um, that are keeping everything sustained and going. Now, what's your sense of that as, as a... Uh, as a legitimate approach to maintaining, um, let's call it a natural environment? Um, I think it can be done. Obviously, um, you know, there's going to be some trial and error in, in really nailing that down, um, especially as we start to experiment more with this. But I, I actually think it, it is pretty doable. So we started some years ago, we started by putting dirt in the tank mm -hmm. as opposed to gravel or, or even sand mm -hmm. uh, and, and went through a process of, uh, well, here it is. This is uh, Ecology of the Planet Aquarium by Diana Wallstead. That's yes. all about putting dirt in the tank. 
Yes. Yes, yeah. that was one of the things that for, kind of first brought me here was I'd been hearing a lot about Wallstad. And I remember you did a, a video where you went through um, her book and also um, addressed some of the uh, gaps in the in the, the research that existed in, um, I think it wasn't it published around 1999, I think, initially? Yeah, that's right. It's important to understand that this book and the research involved is nearly 25 years old. Yes. It's been yes, around a, a long change. time. Uh -huh. Right. In 25 uh, and, years. And in that book, now, I don't know, I haven't talked to, uh, uh, to Diana Wallstead mm -hmm. uh, in recent years. So I know she's retired and, and more and more reclusive. I guess mm -hmm. I am too. Um, but I, I, I think she's gone in a different direction and hasn't really pursued uh, the, 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 the balanced or the natural aquarium to the extent that, uh, that I have. Yeah. So I've done some modification with her system in order to overcome some of the objections she discovered, uh, mainly by adding um uh, elements to the soil uh m minerals primarily some biologicals and by capping the whole thing with sand yes. now up until about two years ago that's as far as i got mm -hmm. then i began to read research uh by people who were looking at the ecology of soil and looking at at the uh the the micro the microscopic life that's involved in soil and that just rang a bell for me because it, 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 i did salt water enough to know that that's really the foundation of any kind of effective salt water tank if you don't have microbiology in there you're not going to keep coral alive, for example. Mm -hmm. So, and so I, I knew the same was true in fresh water, but had nothing to fall back on, other than the fact that we've been doing, in the hobby, leaves. Yes. And not much else. Well, Just what's what's leaves. been really interesting for me, as far as the leaves go, um, and as sort of kind of a, a bridge back to my initial interest in the soil microbiome, is that, you know, the quality of the leaves that go into um, a stream or any body of water ultimately relies largely upon the soil um, that is under, you know, like that the trees, for instance, are feeding off of. So um, that really can have an influence even within the same species of tree, for example. Oh, oh yeah. isn't that interesting? Yes. So the so, composition of the soil matters. Yes, it does seem to matter, um, you know, because if a tree is, say, in an iron-rich soil, it may express more, you know, iron in its um, cellular makeup, um, for example. Um, and then, of course, you know, there are, in, in the cases of some species, um, there are trees and, and plants that are known for sequestering certain substances better than others. Um, but yeah, it's that if they're, you know, even if um, a, a plant is a really good sequester of something like iron, if it's not in an iron rich soil, it's not going to sequester as much as one that is in an iron rich soil, for instance. Yeah. Now the sequesterization issue is mm -hmm. that's that's becoming increasingly important as we understand the stages of plant growth. Yes. And that at different stages. Like when it's, when a plant is creating a stem or leaves mm -hmm. or fruit, those are different stages in the life of that plant. They call on different elements, different mm -hmm. minerals. Yes. So they have to have those elements or minerals sequestered in the soil in order to be able to, to mm -hmm. access them. And a lot of times they actually are relying upon, for example, fungi. Um, and bacteria to help 
them draw some of some of the nutrients out of the soil um, because in some cases they can't actually do that themselves. Nitrogen is kind of a classic example where trees and, and other plants can't fix nitrogen for themselves except in rare circumstances. Um, and so fungi are able to fix nitrogen quite effectively and same for certain kinds of bacteria. So the tree forms a relationship with um, you know, certain kinds of fungi or certain bacteria and then um, they provide the tree tree with the nitrogen and the tree provides the fungi or the bacteria with, you know, some, some generally, I think it's um, sugars and, and forms of energy for them. So it, I, it's, I remember it's when I discovered this about, oh, I don't know, a year ago, I, uh, six o'clock in the morning, I've uh -huh. been researching all night long. I was disheveled <laughs> and exhausted and my eyes were red. Uh -huh. and I, I did a video which is available online called Fungi. Yes. Uh, that that really began to get at this whole issue of and and I think it it just boggles the mind of so many fish keepers when you tell them one of the most oh, important oh, things go. to have in your tank is fungus. Uh huh. Yeah, you know, because I've noticed in a lot of um, sort of your traditional it. aquarium keeping, it's all devoted to like, you know, you got to keep the bacteria and the fungi and, and the algae at bay, you know. Right, right. Mm -hmm. When We've in truth, if you have the get... proper balance of fungi and bacteria and um, and, and other microorganisms, um, it, it is actually net beneficial, more beneficial than, you know, trying to keep everything in a sterile environment. Okay, so what, what I have been proposing for the last few years as something that is very simple that a beginner can do mm -hmm. is maybe a little bit misleading. Mm -hmm. The basics certainly are there putting dirt in the tank, capping it with sand, putting plants in, not overfeeding, putting some leaves in. Those are simple things that anybody can do. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's where we all have to start. Mm -hmm. But as we move through that, we need to be, we need to be gaining an understanding of what it really is that we're doing and what we're really trying to create. That gives yes. us a sense of direction, of purpose, of understanding, and of an ability to accomplish that goal. So that, that kind of leads into what you and Tommy are doing and what the benefit of your work uh, is, is going to be. Yes, actually, before I forget, there was one thing that I learned this this past week that I wanted to share with you that I found just fascinating about um, fungi and and bacteria. So it turns out that um, you know I talked about how they colonize the leaves and they um, and you know their nutrient ratios are you know sometimes not not quite the same in terms of what they need versus what's available to them. So, you know, let's say, for example, that a particular um, microorganism needs maybe um, a high ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus, just throwing that out there. Um, but the but what's available to them has a low ratio of that. What <coughs> what they do is they suck the nutrients, the inorganic nutrients out of the water column initially speaking of sequestering they they initially suck that out of the water column so that they can balance the ratios it's really cool explain that again so so let's say you have um, a microorganism that is going to colonize a leaf and the microorganism needs a high ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus but the leaf has a low ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus the um the fungi or or bacteria whatever this microorganism is in order to um, balance the um, ratio 
will actually suck, I believe, if I'm, if I'm thinking right, nitrogen out of the water column itself in order to balance things out. So huh. as it's taking in, yeah, as it's taking stuff in from the leaf, it's actually also taking stuff out of the water as well. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I haven't yet figured out what exactly that means for an aquarium, but I thought it sounded really interesting. Um, and it's something I certainly never knew. Yeah, I've, I've understood. Um, <clears throat> because these tanks tend to be able to sustain themselves for long periods of time without doing water changes, that there is activity going on that is pulling uh, solubles out of the water column that would otherwise simply build up. Mm -hmm. So there's something about the deep substrate that is utilizing uh, the elements in the water that's having the effect of keeping the water relatively pure. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and maybe this is a component of that, especially if you're adding in leaves that are colonized by fungi and um, bacteria, maybe they are also having an impact on this. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, this is all amazing. Yeah. And, and I'm so thrilled that, that you and Tommy have taken this on. Um, uh, I, what's, what can we expect to see in the next uh, month or so that that will be of value to the hobbyists? So I'm hoping that within the next maybe two or three months, especially with the holidays coming up, you know, that always interrupts things a bit. Um, I'm hoping within the next two or three months, we might at least be able to get together kind of, you know, again, at least a high level um, preliminary guidance document, you know, or at least a draft of that. <laughs> Okay, so I've had people looking at me and saying, why don't you write a book? I think we're on the way. Yeah. And it's not anything I anticipated being able to do because, frankly, I'm not capable of doing what you guys are doing. But this is pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. Now, we're looking at ways of being able to promote this. Yes. Obviously, it's something that is involving a great deal of time and effort mm -hmm. uh, and, and needs to be, deserves to be and needs to be uh, rewarded. So we're going to find a way to set this up through uh, our Patreon channel, which will make it available um, for a monthly fee. Mm -hmm. And there will be more than just this research. What we are able to do is define channels on Discord as Patreon accessible channels, which will allow people who are Patreon members. And I think we can probably also do this with YouTube membership since it, since it involves a manual step. In other words, signing up to Patreon is, is, does not automatically put you on those uh, Discord channels, that has to occur manually. I or someone else has to go in and, and uh, assign roles to that individual so that they can have that access. So there's that being the case, there's no reason why we cannot do that on YouTube as well. Uh, we're at the very early stages of that, but it's something that obviously now we have a product, we have something to be able to link to it that's solid and real and that we'll be able to move forward with. Now, we have already created, you guys are working on a couple of channels on Discord right now. Mm -hmm. 
yes, we're working on a, on um, a few research channels. We're, we're just kind of starting to play around with that and sort of figure out, you know, um, how we want to break that up and, and um, how we want to, to work those. But so far, there it's it's going pretty well, I think. Um, particularly, I think we had a, a channel for illustrators, potentially, people who might be able to, like, illustrate That's the food right. web for us. And um, we've, we've had a few people coming out of the woodwork who are potentially interested in that and British i know there's this one person with the microscope yeah. that's been sending pictures of things they're finding with the microscope which has been incredible that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've gotten to see all kinds of, of fauna we didn't even know about um i think i think there was uh, a few days ago some maybe some kind of um freshwater mites that he sent us pictures of kind yeah of what was that around. little egg did anybody ever figure that out um I th I think that if, if it's the thing I'm thinking about, I think he and I were, were thinking it might be um, maybe a mite that was inside of maybe a chrysalis or, or an egg, possibly, uh, you know, getting ready to emerge. Yeah, it looked like it looked like uh, an embryo in uh, yeah. gelatinous mm -hmm. kind of substance. Huh. Yeah, just just well, really interesting uh, stuff, you yeah, know. So, so already, yeah. it's it's giving us um, lots of ideas. Um, I know Tommy and I have also talked about one of the things that that um, I know I and and he he's been really interested in the tropics. Um, and I, one of the things I'm quite keen on the idea of is trying to include. Um, leaves from the tropics and leaves from different parts of the world like say australia that um are not as frequently covered in the literature so that we can get people um information who live in those regions like australia southeast asia and africa for example um there there is a fair bit of information on the amazon um, but again, it's not as covered usually as the temperate regions. So it's it's something we're trying we're kind of toying around with right now is trying to find information on leaf litter that's available in the tropics so people in those areas can also benefit. Um, and we might be able to also engage with people from those regions to to find out more as well. That's wonderful. Well, I'm excited about this. Uh -huh. uh, Give us, give us a little hint here. Um, what is uh, a very good leaf to be able to put in your tank? Oh, gosh. Um, Tommy has been, been the one who's been looking more at specific leaves. Um, but I think uh, the, the leaves that, that he uh, and I also in some of my readings have been really seeing come up again and again are alder. Um, and the reason for that is because alder is a tree that can fix nitrogen. Huh. So those leaves are right. usually, um, <clears throat> so, so I'll back up a minute. And if we go back to explaining, you know, how things work in the temperate zone, where you ha generally have broadleaf deciduous forests, and in the fall, um, the trees drop their leaves, but before they drop their leaves, they actually suck a lot of the nutrients that they that are in the leaves out of them, and then they drop them. And most trees that don't fix their own nitrogen are going to suck all, as much nitrogen as they possibly can out of the leaves. But alder leaves some of the nitrogen in because since it can fix its own nitrogen, it doesn't need to put as much effort into pulling the nitrogen out. So huh. um, you're getting leaf litter from alder that is richer in nitrogen, potentially, than um, a lot of other leaves. And the importance of that is what? Um, the importance of that is, again, um, usually when we're talking about balancing ratios of elements that plants need for growth and that other organisms need for growth. We're usually talking about carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Those are the big three. So, um, so if you're looking to add nitrogen specifically, um, then getting leaves that are higher in nitrogen is key. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Laura, I thank you so much. We're, we're, this is something that, um, we've been moving toward for a long time mm -hmm. and i think we're uh i think we're crossing a bridge into an area that's really going to provide a lot of benefit to the hobby 
uh, oh, oh, and we'll we'll flesh out the science and also create the techniques. Yes, that uh, that people need to need to learn and develop in order to be able to create a genuinely natural aquarium. Yes. And, and we're hoping that this is going to be a reference that will be useful to people in all segments of the hobby. Amen. Well, thank you, Laura, very much. <laughs> Look forward to getting back again with you. Maybe in a week or two, we'll yeah, see maybe, how. Yeah, maybe in a few weeks. I think Tommy and I will, will have things a little bit more fleshed out then and Wonderful. maybe have a little bit more idea of, of structure <laughs> that we can talk okay, about. Meanwhile, I'm going to be looking for some back doors for people to be able to plug into what you're doing. And, yeah, and we at love. Least, at least be know, able to share the process. Yeah, we love to interact with people. Um, we, we learn all kinds of interesting and new information from everyone. And um, whatever information people have that they can maybe add to the conversation, it would be amazing. So this is occurring on Discord. Yes. Uh, you'll find the link below. It's, it's, it, it's available in everything I do on YouTube. Uh, the link is there. Click in, join up and become part of the conversation that is taking the aquarium hobby in new and wonderful direction. Thank you again, Laura. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking with you tonight. Bye for now.